Today, uh, I have this phenomenal opportunity to interview a remarkable person. Now, I've met him before, and um, you know that's why I can say with confidence that he's a remarkable person. It's not just his personal story, which is absolutely incredible and a must hear, but also what he's trying to do, and that's really important because sometimes we are suckers for a great story, but like, how do is the model and what the person is trying to do really going to result in meaningful, lasting change? Um, and I think in this case it is. Uh, you know, I almost feel like KG introducing rice because that kind of gives away a lot. <laughs> so I'm going to take the hard line and not introduce you, rice, and let the story unfold and just for people to get to know you through that story. Rice, if you could join us. Uh, I think I'm just going to sit here, rice. Maybe we can just uh, kind of. And Venki, if you if I notice you're getting fidgety about the time, I'll I'll get off. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So uh, let me start off with um, a question. Now, Rice Puyan, for those who don't know, is originally from Bangladesh, and uh, so that's the only starting point of the story that I'm going to share. <laughs> but uh, Rice, I want to understand. You know, you moved to the U.S. I think what almost 16 years back? Which year did you move to the US? Yeah, probably around that time. Uh, can you speak, you know, I look at your life in many ways as being before 9-11 and after 9-11. You know, I think that you'll agree, you know, that's one way to look at it. Can you speak a little bit about your life before 9-11, before uh, you moved to the United States? Sure, uh, Sachin, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Namaste, peace be upon you. It's a great honor to be here, and uh, thanks to Brother Asif Ismail for inviting me. Extremely honored. And before I answer your question, uh, I would like to show a, a two minutes video. Uh, would you please uh, press the button? Well, thank you very much, and I just want to show the video to, I mean, to set the stage so you will know the story, and unless, you know, otherwise you'll be thinking where the story is going, what is it all about? <laughs> well, and I hope it, just, it was not a surprise to you showing the video first. It, it was a surprise, but the best kind of surprise, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was born and raised uh, in an upper middle class family in Bangladesh, and uh, as a child, I have seen a lot of poor people, I've seen a lot of discrimination between rich and poor against women. And as a child, I, I used to ask myself why there's so much gap in our society and what can I do when I grow up? I was very lucky to have a first-rate education at a military boarding school in Bangladesh. And later on, I, was, I joined Bangladesh Air Force Academy and uh, I graduated as a pilot officer after two and a half years of rigorous training but I did not feel my destiny was there. So even though I had a 10 years agreement with Bangladesh Air Force that I have to serve, but I asked for release. And when I get a chance to come to US for higher education, I took it. So temporarily, I left my family and my fiance back home and came to US for the higher education and to experience the American dream. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, what happened? What happened to the American dream? Well, um, when I came to first US, I was in New York City. And, um, you know, it was a different culture and different people. And um, after two years staying in New York City, one of my senior friends from my high school invited me to go to visit Texas. And the fact is, I grew up seeing a lot of Western movies. Clint Eastwood was one of my favorite actors. So when he invited, come to Texas, I said, yes, finally I'll be able to see those swinging doors, you know, in a pub, and see some cowboys, cowgirls walking on the street, like the movie style, and walking with the, with the hat, with the buckles, boots, and also maybe gun on their, you know, on their pocket. So I was very excited to go to Texas and see what I saw in the movie. And it was nice, you know, I visited twice, loved the weather, like back home. Big houses, not like New York City, tiny apartments, no offense to New York City. 
and also love the highways, beautiful long highways. Everything was really nice and I fell in love with Texas and also the tuition fee was much cheaper. In, in, <laughs> as a student, you should also look, look for that where you can pay less tuition fee. Still, you can live in a nice apartment. So everything was very nice and uh, right before 9-11, three months before 9-11, I moved to Dallas, Texas with a big hope with the dream that you know it will be a better life, and my friend had a uh, they had gas station business, so he asked me um, if I'd be willing to work with him in a gas station. I said sure, I'd be happy to do that, and um, I was working in a friend's gas station. Ten days after 9/11, September 21st, 2001, I was working in that gas station, and uh, and that day my American dream turned into American nightmare. Should I go more? Yeah. I was working at the friend's gas station um, around 12.30 p.m. A customer walked in the gas station wearing bandana, sunglasses, baseball cap, and he had a double barrel shotgun that he pointed directly at my face. And I was robbed in that gas station before. It's a, it's a very funny experience. A month before that day, middle of August, 2.30 p.m., a customer came to the register, gave me a dollar bill, and a soft drink, so he's a customer. So I opened the cash register, and he took out a gun out of his pocket. And that gas station was in a poor neighborhood, and I thought he wanted to sell his gun. <laughs> because many times, customer came to the gas station to sell their name anything, printer, monitor, jewelry, computer, anything to, sell, to make some money. And I thought he needs some money as well. Even though I had no intention to buy the gun, I said, how much are you asking for? He said, give me the money. I said, but sir, you're not telling me how much you're asking for. He said, give me the money. I said, yes, yeah, sure, but you're not telling me how much you're asking for. I had no clue that I was being robbed inside the gas station. So the third time, he cocked the gun and he said, I will blow up your brain if you don't give me the money. That time I realized, oh, I'm being robbed right now. So I gave him the money. But when this gentleman came, I did, not, I did not think that, you know, he's coming to sell his gun. I was ready with the money. He walked in, and it was 10 days after 9-11. So as soon as he walked in, I said, sir, here's all the money. Take it, but please do not shoot me. I, I took two steps back, but he was not looking at the money, though. He was looking at me. And I felt a cold air flow through my spine. That why he is not looking at the money? Why he's looking at me? And then he mumbled a question, where are you from? And before I could say more than excuse me, he shot me from four feet away with that double barrel shotgun on the right side of my face. I couldn't believe that he really did that. I felt it first, like a million bees stinging my face. And then I heard the sound, like a big explosion. And I remember myself screaming, Mom, extremely loudly. And I looked left, and I saw the gunman was still standing and looking at me. And blood was pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. And I thought, if I don't pretend I'm dying, he will shoot me again. So I fell down on the floor, and after a few seconds, the gunman left the store. So you're lying on the floor, bleeding profusely, how are you still alive? What happened? Well, that's a good question. You know, I was so afraid. I even could not, you know, uh, I didn't have the, the, the you know, the, I was so afraid that I could not dial 9 I thought, I felt I was dying. But then I told myself that, you know, I just cannot lie down here for help. Grabbed the phone and I ran outside, went to the barbershop next door. And uh, three men inside looked at me in horror because I was bleeding so badly. They looked at me in horror and they tried to escape away. I mean, run away through the ex exit door. I caught one of them and I said, please do not leave. Call 911, I'm dying. I don't want to die today. So he called 911 and I caught myself in the mirror and I couldn't believe that was my face. It's, you know, full of blood and blood was, you know, pouring. And uh, instead of lying down or staying in the barber shop, I came outside in the parking lot and I was running from one side to the other looking for ambulance because at that moment, at that time, I thought each and every single second is extremely important. I should not just sit tight and wait for ambulance. 
So I was running back and forth, and I was very lucky. I saw ambulance within a few minutes, and as soon as I saw the ambulance, I started running towards it, taking off my shirts and my shoes off. And on my way to the hospital, I felt, I saw the images of my mother, my father, my siblings and my fiance appeared before my eyes, one after another one. And then the image of graveyard. And at that time, I could not think clearly. My brain was shutting down. I could not see anything. My eyes were getting, you know, uh, also getting closed. And you can imagine that, you know, you cannot think, you cannot see, but then there are beautiful faces coming one after another one. That's a very scary moment. And I thought maybe my time is up. And that's why I'm seeing their faces for the last time. And I'll be gone from this world at any moment. And at that moment, I promised to God that I'm too young to live today. And I haven't accomplished anything with my life yet. But if you give me a chance to live, live and I promise I would do good things with my life. I would dedicate my life for others, especially for the poor, the needy, and the deprived. But please give me a chance to live. And I promise I would do that. Rice, now I know from my earlier conversations with you that those the weeks that followed and the months that followed were full of trauma for you. Actually, you know, um, the nightmare was just getting started. And I know that you went through financial challenges, physical challenges, all sorts of things. So there was so much reason for you to feel anger and hate and, uh, you know, against this man who incidentally was caught. And as you saw from the video, he was put on death row. Um, why do you think this, what could have been anger and hate, ultimately became mercy? Can you talk a little bit about the personal process? Sure. I mean, um, it was not easy because, you know, I came here as a student and uh, there was no loved one in this country. I was, I was alone by myself. And um, the hospital I was taken into, it was private and expensive and I had no health insurance. So you can imagine what was my consequence, what was my situation. The hospital discharged me the next day morning and told me to, you know, uh, arrange my follow-up treatment. And it was pretty painful. Uh, not having any health insurance and being shot, you know, from four feet away. And, uh, but the first thing I, I did after I got my life back, I did not ask God why I got shot. I asked him that help me to go through the, the hardship, the situation I'll be facing from now onward, help me to go through that. And I thanked him for saving my life because the day before I was begging that don't take me and he gave me a second chance. So I should be thankful instead of being angry why I got shot. So I thank God and I said, help me to go through this process and help me to find out why did he give me a second chance? Because the guy who shot me, he also killed two others. One man from India named Wakar Hassan, another gentleman from Pakistan named Vasudev Patel. And uh, he shot me from four feet away. My brain should have been blown away. But so I asked God that help me to understand why did he give me a second chance? So instead of being angry, sad, and depressed, I thought about my mom's teaching, what she taught me when I was a little kid. Because I told you that I went to military boarding school at the age of 11. So before I went to that school, my mother taught me that you'll, uh, basically you'll be growing up with a bunch of kids and with your teachers. Many, you know, in, in, in some cases, you know, your friends, classmates may not be, you know, uh, they, they might be mean, they may say something bad to you. First thing you should do, you should put a zipper on your mouth. Do not say a single word. Take time and give him little time to think about what he did to you. Because if you say something bad to him, then the cycle starts. But if you don't say anything, it ends there, first of all. Second thing is that the guy, the person who says something bad to you, he will get a chance to think about that what he did, it was wrong. And if he is a human being, he will come back to you today or tomorrow. But take time, do not say anything bad. If you can forgive and move on. And I was thinking that I already got shot. I'm already facing a lot of bad things in my life. So instead of being sad, depressed, angry, let's move on. Because if I stayed like that, I'll not be able to move on. So I thought about my mom's teaching that forgive and move on. And I followed that and also doing the next right thing. Because I came to this country quitting my Air Force career back home with a dream that to do good something, to do something bigger and better that I could not do in my birth country. So if I stay sad, angry, depressed, that dream will never come true. I need to 
pursue my dream by doing the next right thing, by forgiving the person who hurt me and move on. I think all those things really helped me to go through a healing process and it took time. But I always wanted to find out that terrible thing happened. I got shot, my fiance left, a lot of bad things happened. But there is something good in there. I need to find that out. I think that helped me to go through the process and, you know, I mean, forgive him and uh, do the, you know, find my passion, you know, and also uh, trying to make it as a, try to get something good out of this extremely negative experience. Now, there's a lot to this story, and fortunately, there's a book about it. <laughs> it's called The True American uh, by Anand Girdar Das, and I just feel that, you know, it's a great uh, story to read. Um, so, and I'll also leave it for you to walk up to Rice and have a longer conversation. Rice, we're going to be, we're getting pushed for time, but I, I, there's a question that I feel is absolutely critical. Uh, you did this yourself. You broke this cycle of hate right. um, that could have consumed you. Uh, what is it that you want to do for other people, especially young people in the United States, uh, to break the cycle of hate? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's what distinguishes you from a great story to someone who can be a change maker. Uh, so I'd love to hear that. Sure. Uh, is it the last question or do you have more questions? Yes. The last question. Okay. I need to know that uh, so that I can give you a wrong answer. Well, uh, the, the person who shot me, he was given death penalty. And um, I wanted to not only, when I, when I forgave him, I thought it was not enough. Yes, I forgave him, but still he's going to be executed. So what is the benefit of this forgiveness? And I saw him as a victim too. I saw him as a human being like myself. He had a poor upbringing. And the, the type of childhood I had, he did not have that. So I felt empathy for him. I felt compassion and I thought forgiveness was not enough. So when I went to Mecca, when I went for a pilgrimage in 2009 with my mother, um, it's in, in the Mecca, I stayed a month and I, I deeply re, you know, realized that hate and revenge may bring temporary satisfaction, but they don't bring any, any they, they don't bring peace or solution to any situation. They only bring more disaster and more misery. And I also deeply thought about that the guy who shot me, in the, he, he has been waiting in a death row, waiting to die. By killing him, we would simply lose another human life without dealing with the root cause, which in this case was hate and ignorance. And, but if he was given a chance to live, even by and bar, he might become a better person. He might contribute to society in a positive way. And I thought, I must do something to save the life. So from the pilgrimage, I came back to U.S. and I formed a coalition with the help of Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Christian, atheists, to get him removed from death row. And uh, it's a non-profit non organization in London called Reprieve. They helped me to take my campaign to the European Union Parliament, German Parliament, and also uh, at the headquarters of Lundbeck. It's a lethal injection manufacturer in Denmark. And I was able to convince them to write a letter to the governor of Texas, and they did. Not only that, at the end of 2011, Lundbeck announced that they, they would stop supplying this drug to the U.S. prison so that they cannot kill inmates in the U.S. prison. So as a result of this announcement, now there is a huge shortage of this, this, uh, this drug in the U.S. prisons. And you have seen this year, May, there was a botched execution in Oklahoma. And because of that, this case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. So not only that, I also went to the U.S. US Supreme Court asking for clemency for Mark Stroman. But despite all these efforts, Mark Stroman was executed July, uh, 2000, uh, July 2011. But before that, he was a change person. He talked about world peace. He talked about mercy. He talked about human rights. And you'll be shocked. He called me brother, and he said he loved me in an eight-second phone conversation before he was executed. So you see, this is the man who shot me in the face, killed two other innocent human beings, simply because of his heart was filled with hate and ignorance. But when he, he found passion, compa you know, when he found compassion, love, mercy from the victims, it helped him to change. So this is why I tell people that if you want to hate something, hate the act, hate the behavior, the attitude, not the person, because person can change tomorrow, given the right education, right tools, right guidance, and Mark Stroman, before he was executed, he, his last words were, 
Hate is going on everywhere. It has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. I suffer terribly. There is no doubt about that. I lost vision in one eye. I lost a tooth. I was kicked out from my home because I couldn't work in parent. My father suffered a stroke. My fiance left me. I had medical bill, $60,000 plus. Red Cross told me, you qualified for one week's worth of groceries. It's a long list, but I did not die, I survived. And uh, I suffered terribly, but you know, I mean, I, because of one person's hate and ignorance, but that tragedy helped me to see the possibility of a world without hate, a world full of love, a world full of compassion and empathy. Yes, I could not save the life of one man named Mark Stroman, but perhaps I'll, you know, I can save more Mark Strumans and also prevent them making future victims by spreading awareness of ways to prevent hate crimes and by educating the transformational power of mercy and forgiveness. And one way I think to do is, is to teach young people, treat everybody well, regardless of their skin color, their socioeconomic situation, their religious affiliation, sexual orientation, or nationality. I think that's why I focus on high school, junior high school, and also university. I work in full time in IT, and I also go all over the world and talk about the regenerative power of mercy and, and forgiveness. And I have an organization called World Without Hate. The vision is to end the cycle of hate and violence and to educate people that how can we live in a peaceful world? How can we drop the grass from our heart, all the ignorance, the hate, so that we and our next generation can live in a peaceful world?